The place is Korea. The time, early October 1950. UN landings at Incheon have been successful. Troops of Major General Edward M. Allman's 10th Corps are mopping up around liberated Seoul. Now plans are made to sweep on north into enemy territory to crush the retreating Red. New mission of the 8th Army is to continue its drive up the west coast. Objective, Pyongyang, North Korean capital. To weaken any strong Red resistance, the UN command plans an amphibious assault on the enemy's left flank. Should Pyongyang fall to the 8th Army, UN forces attacking from the east would swing northward, clearing northeast Korea of remaining Red troops. The 10th Corps is given this job. By mid-October, the Corps is ready for another amphibious operation. The 1st Marine Division embarks at Incheon. 7th Division troops go overland and sail from Pusan. These two divisions, with the 2nd Engineer Special Brigade and the 1st Marine Air Wing, make up the striking force of 10th Corps at this time. Within three days, the convoy lies off Wonsan, North Korean port selected for the landing. But on land, the tactical situation has changed. Fast-moving ROK troops driving up the east coast and crossing the 38th parallel have moved north into enemy territory. Covering 15 miles a day by rapid foot marches, they drive on to Wonsan. After capturing that city, they push on toward Ham Hung. With beaches in friendly hands, the 10th Corps troops could land unopposed at Wonsan to support the 8th Army attack on Pyongyang. But landings must be delayed when the waters are found to be heavily mined. A few days pass while elements of the Corps stand offshore waiting. Then, as the Navy task force under command of Rear Admiral Thackeray succeeds in clearing paths through the intensive minefields, preparations for landings are completed. But by this time, the 8th Army, driving up the west coast, has captured Pyongyang and is continuing northward after the retreating communists. The original plan for the 10th Corps to drive west to link up with the 8th Army is discarded and the alternate plan put into effect. New mission, destroy or drive the enemy out of northeast Korea. The Corps is assigned the entire area east of the Taebak mountain range and north of the coastal town of Kojo. Initially, the Corps area is divided into two zones. The 1st Rock Corps, now under operational control of 10th Corps, is assigned the northern zone. The 1st Marine Division takes over the area in the south. While the new situation is being assessed, and plans are prepared for the general advance to the north, the 1st Marine Division, commanded by Major General Smith, lands unopposed at Wonsan. The main body of the Marine Division moves north to the Ham Hung area. Remaining elements go west to Meijan and south to Kojo to protect the Corps rear from roving bands of North Korean troops bypassed by the 8th Army and 1st Rock Corps in their sweeping drives up the peninsula. These communist forces have organized into strong guerrilla bands. Moving north, they threaten to cut 10th Corps supply routes along its rear and western boundaries. Marines at Kojo are first to meet these bands. There is fierce fighting before the Reds are driven off. The guerrillas drift northwestward and are met by Marines at Meijan. While fighting is going on at Kojo and Meijan, the core area is redivided into three zones. ROK troops are already in the northern zone assigned to them. Marines are moving into their western zone. The 7th Infantry Division, commanded by Major General Barr, takes over the central sector. Instead of going ashore at Wonsan with the Marines, the 7th, with the 2nd Engineer Special Brigade, moves up the coast to Iwan. 
Once again, an assault landing is unnecessary, but the beach must be checked and surrounding waters cleared of mines before the division can go ashore. As the seventh lands, its units quickly move inland. Banning out over the area the division is to cover, troops start north after the retreating enemy. Meanwhile, throughout the entire core area where UN forces are in control, the command is busy re-establishing order in the pattern of democracy. Native specialists are called on to help with medical supplies and other civilian needs. By the time the Corps is ready to move north, the civil government has been reorganized to conform to democratic principles. By the middle of November, the 3rd Infantry Division, under command of Major General Seoul, arrives from Japan, remaining in the Wonsan area to protect supply routes from bypassed Red guerrillas. Marine elements move north from Kojo and Meijan to join the main body of the 1st Marine Division which is slowly probing its way toward the Chosen Reservoir. One reason for the slow, cautious advance is the stiffening enemy resistance. ROK patrols have reported encountering Chinese communist troops, which apparently have moved down across the Korean border from Manchuria. These reports are confirmed when Marines bring in prisoners. Elements of several Chinese communist divisions are identified in the area. Weather and terrain also slow the advance. It's rugged, mountainous country all the way, and roads are bad. In the east, along the coast, where terrain and roads are better, ROK troops move faster, advancing toward Changjin. Here, rocks are fighting the last organized remnants of North Korean forces between them and the Manchurian-Soviet border. Offshore, UN warships soften enemy strong points. Carrier-based planes furnish close air support for both the rocks in the east and the 7th Infantry Division pushing north. With the main body of the division fanning out behind them, forward elements of the 7th approach their objective, Haisanjin on the Yalu River along the Manchurian border. Other elements of the 7th Division clear the sector of bypassed communist forces. Less than one month after they landed at Iwan, troops of the 7th enter Haisanjin. There's nothing between them and Manchuria, except the frozen Yalu. By Thanksgiving, they have taken up positions along the river. To most of these men, the war appears to be over, or should be by Christmas. Their optimism seems to be shared by everyone. And it is to accomplish just this that the 8th Army launches its all-out assault to drive the remaining Reds out of Korea. The main body of the North Koreans facing UN forces in the West is receiving reinforcements and supplies from Manchuria. One of the main supply lines crosses the Yalu at Mampo Jin and follows the main highway south to the front. New mission of the 10th Corps is to cut this supply route at Mupyong and then drive north to Manpo Jin. As the new UN plan of attack goes into effect, the western boundary of 10th Corps shifts to take in the new area of operations. There's a corresponding shift of divisional boundaries and troops. The 3rd remains in the south. Marine and 7th Division zones swing westward. Rocks retain the northeast sector. Only the rocks continue to drive northward. The 7th pulls back. 
Elements are ordered west to protect the right flank of the Marines already moving to spearhead the attack. The third moves north to guard the left flank. This new plan of attack presents the Corps command with a difficult supply problem. The railroad ends a few miles beyond Ham Hung, and from there supplies must be hauled by truck. The main supply route, poor and in need of repair, cannot logistically support more than a division. On 24 November, the 8th Army launches its all-out assault. Forward elements of the Marines reach Udam. Suddenly and without warning, the Chinese attack. They check the 8th Army advance and block the 10th Corps at Udam. But the 8th Army's right flank receives the heaviest blow. It disintegrates, and Chinese sweep south in overwhelming numbers. Elements of the 3rd deployed to protect 10th Corps' exposed western flank. As for the Marines at Udam, it's no longer a question of advancing. Completely surrounded, they hold their position. Elements of the 7th Division on the right flank of the Marines are not so fortunate. Overwhelmingly outnumbered, they are driven back and trapped on the east side of the Chosen Reservoir. In desperate fighting, these heavily depleted units withdraw to Hagaru. The Marines also receive orders to pull back to Hagaru. They have to fight their way back in the bitter cold of the Korean winter which has enveloped the front. Under continuous fire from the Chinese, they find little time to rest or warm themselves. Close support by the Air Force and Marine Air Wing helps balance the power for the UN. After the initial surprise assault, they keep the Chinese from massing for a major attack against the 10th Corps. Planes of the Combat Cargo Command also play an important role. Without regular airdrops of ammunition and essential supplies, it would be difficult for any of the encircled units to get out. The Marines finally reach Hagaru. It takes them five cold, bloody days and nights of fighting. But Hagaru is also surrounded, and fighting continues, mostly at night. In the daytime, planes take over, pinning the enemy to the hill. The C-47 landing strip, started when Hagaru was first taken, is placed in operation. A steady stream of planes brings in supplies and takes out wounded and cold weather casualties. With Hagaru only 20 minutes by air from Hung Nam and only four hours from Japan, the mortality rate, even among the seriously wounded, is surprisingly low. As the tactical situation develops, the command decides to concentrate troops in the Hung Nam area to form a stronger and more effective fighting force. The 3rd Division is ordered up from the south. The 7th Division and 1st Rock Corps are ordered down from the north. At the same time, a task force made up of units of the 3rd is sent to open the Hagaru Ham Hung Road for core troops trapped in the reservoir region. The task force starts toward Koto. Other elements of the Corps deploy in the mountains east and west of the rescue road to hold back the main body of Chinese. Opening the road is slow work. Roadblocks have to be removed. The Chinese must be driven out of the hills on either side. And once the road is cleared, it must be held open.
As the task force works its way north, fighting continues at Hagaru. Anything that might be of use to the enemy is destroyed. Marines and elements of the 7th Infantry Division that managed to escape the red trap around the reservoir start south toward Hong Nam. Flank and advance guards move to the sides and ahead of the main body of troops to drive back the Chinese. The huge column of men and equipment moves slowly. Often it must stop in the cold, sometimes for hours while engineers repair the road. At this time, General MacArthur visits Yang Po to confer with his combat commanders. As a result of this conference, the UN commander orders the 10th Corps to withdraw from Northeast Korea and an evacuation area is prepared around Ham Hung and the port of Hung Nam. The defense perimeter is established as each infantry division and the ROC Corps is assigned a sector. During the day, troops patrol the area in front of their forward positions. At night, they withdraw to prepare defensive positions within the inner perimeter. All the artillery of the 10th Corps is concentrated on the beach. Coordinated with guns of warships in the harbor, it provides a curtain of steel for the entire perimeter. With the problem of defense solved, the Corps Command turns its attention to the problem of evacuation. Before a method is decided upon, every available means is considered. Overland is found impractical due to the poor roads and the distance involved. Because of the limited number of planes available, a mass air evacuation is also held to be impractical. Evacuation by sea is the logical means. Already a number of vessels are in the harbor. More can be diverted from other Korean ports and from Japan. Busan, the destination of the 10th Corps, is little more than a 24-hour trip by sea. The Navy is confident that by utilizing turnaround shipping, enough will be available to complete the evacuation. Back in the mountains, Corps troops have reached Koto, a regimental position below Hagaru. But their stop here is brief. Within a few hours, they begin breaking camp and prepare to start down through the mountains to Hong Nam. The small airstrip at Koto can handle only light aircraft. These are used to evacuate the wounded and serious cold weather casualties. Finally, the column starts down the last icy stretch of mountain road that separates it from Ham Hung. Security forces drive the communists away from the road. But a few miles outside of Koto, where the road crosses the face of a steep cliff, the Reds have destroyed a vital bridge. Within a matter of hours, the Combat Cargo Command is preparing to send a new bridge by air. A short time later, eight C-119s, each carrying a span of the bridge, are over the column. The 16-ton bridge is dropped, the first time an airdrop of a complete bridge has been attempted in combat. A few hours later, the column is again on the move. At Hong Nam, the work to build up and strengthen the defense perimeter continues. With the road held open, the column moves faster. In less than a day, leading elements are out of the mountains and approaching Ham Hung. Camps have been set up in the port area. With dock facilities limited, a landing craft shuttle service has been established to carry troops to the ships in the harbor. The wounded that were not flown out earlier are the first to be evacuated.
troops come next. The evacuation is carefully timed. There is a minimum of waiting. When troops arrive at the docks, landing craft are ready to take them aboard. Organizational equipment follows. The amount of equipment being brought out is evidence of how completely the situation is under control during the withdrawal. Tenth Corps units have been ordered to bring out everything. They are doing just that. Nothing is left behind unless it is completely useless. For three days, troops continue to pour into Ham Hung. Elements of the 3rd Division keep the road open. With the boarding of the last Marine combat troops, the Corps Control Group in charge of loading turns attention to huge stockpiles of fuel and supplies that jam the port. North Korean civilians are called in to help. Following the plan of evacuation, the rocks are pulled from the perimeter and outloaded. Many rock units have been taken out earlier from ports further north. As the evacuation progresses, fighting around the perimeter continues. Demolition squads lay explosives throughout the city. The perimeter tightens. Yongpo airfield on the edge of the city is abandoned. The 7th Division is the next to board ship. Again, the perimeter tightens. Big guns of the fleet continue to pound the Chinese in the hills. As the evacuation nears its final phase, thousands of North Korean refugees swarm into the area, hoping to be taken out with the troops. As many as possible are evacuated. Demolition squads destroy everything that might be useful to the enemy. Finally, the 3rd Division begins to move out. The perimeter shrinks to a beachhead held by one lone battalion. Warships cover their withdrawal. Tons of explosives have been placed around the remaining buildings, piers, and other installations of the port. The day before Christmas, the last battalion of the 3rd Division is evacuated, and what remains of Hung Nam is abandoned to the enemy. After the last boat leaves shore, the order is given and the entire port blown up. Warships shell what remains of the city. Within two weeks from the time it was ordered, evacuation of the 10th Corps is completed. Over 200,000 troops and refugees have been evacuated and along with them, 350,000 tons of supplies and equipment and 17,000 vehicles of every kind. Not only has this huge UN fighting force been evacuated intact, but within seven days, 10th Corps units are again battling the enemy in Central Korea.